right, good morning everyone. We are starting the, the last of the three, three sections of this study. So uh, a new, uh, new notes this morning that were on the table there. So if you didn't get one of those, I didn't send those out those to you yet, did you? Oh no, the, I did send the whole. Are they special notes? The They're not special out? notes, yes. Not that. Okay, perfect. Yep. Wait. Then you're then so, you're good. So then you're good. This? That's the one. I got it. All right, perfect. All right. Uh, so uh, we finished up last time. So we looked at at uh, the idea of, of election, right? What the Bible has to tell us about election. Uh, God has chosen us. Uh, we looked at uh, the, the Bible truth of, okay, once God has given you that gift of faith, is it possible to lose that? Right? And, and uh, I think the, the first page or two of the previous lesson, um, I didn't put together a summary of the, of the lesson like I did for the first lesson because the, the first two pages of the last lesson, I think, provide a very clear side-by-side uh, -side Bible passage. Here's God's promises to keep us in the faith. Here's God's warnings uh, against losing our faith. Um, and the, the parallel of, of those passages side by side. Um, so today we're going to look at uh, the, uh, the blessing that God gives us in his means of grace, his visible means of grace uh, in the sacraments. Okay? Um, and before I forget, uh, for our worship service this morning too, uh, we will be gathering in the narthex before the service. Uh, and uh, we will have a palm procession with everybody. You, you know, a lot of times we have the kids kids doing it, but um, today's service is going to be um, a service of the passion. Uh, so we will begin. Um, so what we're basically going to do is go from uh, from Palm Sunday through Good Friday this morning in our service. Uh, so we're going to begin with the Palm Sunday Gospel. And, and the, the procession uh, that, that uh, Jesus had as he went into Jerusalem. Uh, we will process into the church. We will sing our Palm Sunday hymn. Um, and then we will go into the passion history of, of our Savior. And we're going to walk all the way through the entire passion history this morning um, to get our, our minds and hearts prepared for Thursday and Friday service. Uh, because... Uh, and, and many of you have joined us on the Wednesday evening services, and I pray that it's not going to be a repeating for you, but rather uh, we're going to do it all in one service, uh, which I think will really help us. Uh, and so we're going to do each section. We'll have uh, a hymn uh, in between each section, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll walk all the way through the passion, passion history. Uh, so when we arrive for th our Thursday service, uh, we'll be ready for, for Monday, Thursday, uh, as we worship on Good Friday, and then for, for Easter, uh, to have that, that celebration. Um, all right? So, uh, we will begin uh, then on page, so if you have the, the, the notes, uh, it's a, a brand new lesson, but the page number is page 14. Page 14. So, uh, let's begin this morning and ask for God's blessing. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today. We ask for your guidance and blessing upon our study. Uh, Lord, you give us the power of your word written down on the pages of the scriptures. Uh, and written on the pages of the scriptures are also your instructions and commands to use uh, your means of grace in every way that you have given them to us. Uh, that also includes your command to, to baptize and your command to uh, to feast on this special supper that you've given to us this morning as we begin our study of, of uh, your uh, wonderful gift of baptism. Uh, remind us of your words and promises and help us to receive the comfort that you intend uh, in this blessed sacrament. We ask it in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, so the, the third part of our, of our lesson then uh, is uh, looking at the sacraments. Are they symbols or are they substance? Right? Is this a church ceremony or is this the substance of God's word that he has given us to use and commanded us to use? Um, if, it's a, if it's a symbol or a ceremony, um, that takes us down a completely different path. If it, if it is uh, God's word in action, uh, then it fits right in with, with the proclamation of God's word in every other aspect of our lives and the way that God has created it, that faith in our, in our hearts. And, and also uses that same means of grace then to, to strengthen, strengthen us and keep us in our faith. 
Okay? Um, so we're going to begin with just a, a real quick, um, you know, you can spend a moment, moment thinking, but um, from, your, from your own experiences, uh, in your conversations, right, and that's kind of what, uh, where, where this whole study has, has stemmed from, um, what are some of the, the divisions that you see uh, in your conversations uh, when, when talking about uh, regarding the sacraments, baptism, uh, Holy Communion? Uh, well, there is within Christianity, there is a di division there. There's, there's one group of churches that believe you have to be uh, knowledgeable and old enough to understand what the words mean in order to be an effective baptism. Uh, uh, and then there are those who believe in infant baptism. So there is a division within Christianity. And, and when we look at, at Jesus' command to baptize, which we will um, we'll look at these at the Bible passage, because again, we can have all kinds of ideas of what Bible about, about what baptism is. Um, but we need to go back to the scriptures and see okay, what does what do the words of scripture actually tell us about, about baptism? Uh, what are Jesus' commands? Uh, what are the passages that tell us um, who is being baptized? Uh, what is happening in baptism? Uh, what are the blessings that follow from, from baptism? Okay. Uh, that also helps us then to get the definition for the sacraments that we, we have. So the, the, the definition for, sac for the sacraments that we'll, we'll have at the bottom of page 14 that we'll have in just a few moments, uh, we didn't just pull those out of thin air. Right? Uh, that comes from the study of those scripture passages that say, okay, this is, here's, here's the command of Jesus. So this is a command that comes from Jesus. Uh, what are the blessings that are being described? Uh, right? uh, it, it, it specifically says right, forgiveness of sins, um, gives you life, gives you salvation. Right? It's, baptism saves you. Right? We look at these, at these passages. Uh, Jesus tells us to use water, right? to, uh, to baptize, right? to wash with water. Right? So there's a visible element. Uh, you know, we look at we look at all of those things and say, okay, this is where we get the definition for that because these commands that we have from Jesus fall into this, and those passages uh, describe it, specifically those blessings that come as a result of it. Right. So, uh, so what I want to make it very clear because we'll be we'll be defining what a sacrament is, and to understand that that we didn't come up with those with those definitions of what a sacrament is. Right. Those the 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 compilation of those three or, or, or four things, right? If you divide some of those three things, you can come up with four. But it comes specifically from what Jesus is telling us about these sacraments. Uh, about what, he, what does he say about baptism? What does he say about the Lord's Supper? Uh, and when he, when he gives us these things and tells us what the blessings are, uh, that's where we come up with those definitions, right? Do, do, I, do I make myself clear? on? I, I want to make sure that, you know, because um, all... You know, make different churches have definitions for all kinds of different things and say, well, that's not, that's not the definition that we have for, for what a sacrament is. Uh, or, you know, but it's like, okay, well, where do we get this definition from? Right? Um, and then I, I also, right, because it doesn't matter what we are saying about what we believe unless, right, we can go back to Scripture and say, this is what the Lord says. Uh, because ultimately, that's that's. The, the understanding, right? That's where we have our solid foundation. Uh, not Lutheran versus Reformed, right? But what does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? Um, and as I, as I tell everyone that I, that I take through instructions, whether it's the kids or whether it's the adults uh, in our, our Bible Basics class, uh, that as we learn these things together, I want you to be able to say, I believe this, not because Pastor Schmeichel taught me this, um, not because this is what the Lutheran Church teaches, right? This is what my congregation believes. Um, but I believe this because this is what the scriptures say. And here are the passages that say this. If, if I can go back to that, right, then it does, then, then hopefully many of those, right, well, that's what your church says, and that was, you know, the, the, whole, the whole thing that often, right, well, that's your interpretation, or you know, all those things, hopefully, they, they may not go away, but we'll certainly have a, a better, and, and simply say, uh, here's, here's the words of Scripture. 
Right? Let's, let's look at what God actually says. And then let's, let's take God at his word. And if I, if I look at what scripture says, if I look at the actual words, uh, right, because that's always the, the first question after when I'm, when I'm doing, when we're doing a Bible study, right, and we read through a, a Bible passage, and then there's some questions say, well, what's the, what's the question? And I don't really have to stop and think about it, right? I can just go back to the words that were in that Bible passage and say, here's what it says. Now put it in your own words. What is God actually saying here? Um, and, and I don't try to. I don't need to try to, to make up something, right? God's very clear on what He says, uh, and and since God is so clear in what He says, uh, that does make it a little easier, a little simpler, right? Uh, we tend to complicate things, and that's not just true in right in in our faith. Uh, that's true in every aspect of our lives, right? Uh, well, things aren't, aren't ever as simple as they seem. Sometimes they are, right? Uh, and if I try to complicate it, then right, that's that's oftentimes where uh, all the questions and doubts and, and things begin uh, begin to begin to see. Okay, any questions on that before we get into the into the actual actual thing? Uh, all right. So John gave gave one uh, uh, one insight. Anybody have anything else, Brian? Is the body of Christ and is almost a uh, an object of worship. Okay. Yep. Can you hold that thought until we get? Because the second part of this will actually be be Lord's Supper, right? So, um, but uh, but you're but you're right. You're exactly right. Uh, right. So, the, the, as we look at at the sacraments and the definition for sacraments, we're going to be looking at at that overall definition, and then we're going to zero in on on uh, baptism and then the Lord's Supper. But exa exactly, right? Uh, if, a, if, it's, if it turns into something, uh, and, and uh, maybe just a quick follow-up, that's also one of the reasons uh, why those that are in uh, the called ministry of the Catholic Church, they are called priests. Why are they called priests? Because they're sacrificing, exactly. Um, and that goes back to... Right, that was the main job of the of the Old Testament priest was to sacrifice, uh, and it is a and and you know if you talk if you have any Catholic friends and, and they're talking about going to church they won't say well, I'm going to church they'll say I'm going to mass or confession, uh, hmm? or confession. right uh, but when they go to church right they go to mass right uh, but the but the official title of their service is the sacrifice of the mass right uh, this is a re-sacrificing that goes on over over and over again. Uh, which uh, you know, you read through the letter to the Hebrews, um, and that God says something very different, right? Christ was sacrificed once. He doesn't need to be. There isn't a sacrifice that goes over and over again for for sins, uh, right? Jesus Jesus died once. Uh, he was sacrificed once. Uh, and then what does he say? He says, "Do this in remembrance of me." And we know that that remembrance part is a part of it, right? It's not the main thing in the sacrament, right? Because if it becomes the main thing in the sacraments, right, then you kind of push aside what Jesus actually says, right? Given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins, right? And if all I'm thinking about is remembering what Jesus has done for me, and if it turns into a remembrance meal, then it's more or less just a fellowship meal, right? That we're remembering what Jesus has done. And it doesn't really matter who takes it. Right, uh, but if it's something specific for the forgiveness of sins, and we look at, at you know we'll look at First Corinthians eleven, uh, where we you know we, we see uh, what is what does God God say there? Right, he, that uh, person ought to examine themselves. If they eat and drink without recognizing what's going on, they actually are sinning against the body and blood of, of Jesus. That's like, whoa, whoa, okay, we've got to we've got to be be uh, real intentional on on how we instruct and. And before somebody re received that, um, and there, so we, so even though the sacraments offer the same blessings, God has some different instructions for for each each of the sacraments. Uh, as I like to, to describe it, baptism is used to introduce people to Jesus. Uh, Lord's Supper is for those who know Jesus and know what what Jesus has has done, which is why we instruct 
everybody, right? It's not just somebody walking in the door for the first time, but um, even you know our members who have been members since since little babies, right? They get instructed before before they before they uh, re start receiving the Lord's Supper. John, there are some churches that believe they even marry the society. Well, yeah, the, the Catholic Church has seven rather than 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 two. Right. Yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah. And and so and marriage is marriage is one of those. Uh, right. And and so. Uh, but again, then they have they have different definitions for what what is is a sacrament. Okay. Other other thoughts, conversations, or or things that, that jump out at, at you. Right. This is my confession. This is my yeah, confession. this is my confession. This is my public public statement on, and they they uh, to a certain extent almost turn baptism into confirmation. Yes. That this is uh, this is my public confession of of faith. Yes. Um, and and we'll we'll talk about what that's uh, what that does to the sacrament, then. <laughs> um, because we we do need to look at specifically what does. God say about the comfort and blessings that, that we have in, in baptism. Okay? Anything else? I'm just going back to John the Baptist. He did it and he was in on earth and he was baptizing and, and uh, the Pharisees seem like to be an element of profession of faith. And uh, when you and the only the only baptized the apostles that I'm aware of. Oh uh, and it says people were coming. Yeah. Um doesn't it doesn't it doesn't say the ages of them, um, and the other aspect of John's baptism and the and and Jesus' baptism, essentially right are both a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, right. Uh, however, right John is baptizing before Jesus instituted it as a sacrament, right. And so we can look at John's at John's uh, you know at John's baptism, right, and, and we we see that that there was. There was this act that was going on uh, before uh, Jesus, and you know, even in, early in Jesus' ministry, what does he say? Right when he meets with John with, with Nicodemus in the middle of the night, right? No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Right? Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Okay? Um, and so that that's uh, creation and or strengthening of of faith. Uh, is the element of, of baptism as we will as we'll uh, get into with the with the, the passages that we'll be looking at. And John the Baptist was using water and the faith, I guess, also in the same mm -hmm. yeah. He actually baptized people for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and as Jesus went down into the water, right, and, and we'll we'll talk about you know, the, the the actual word uh, baptize, right, as as uh, as uh, as scripture uses it, and that, by the way, is another way is that earlier baptism, John the Baptist says, immersion versus sprinkling of water. Does it say that? Uh, I does it say it? <laughs> <laughs> I think so, but I'm not. Okay, it it says that Jesus went into the water. Uh, does it say that Jesus was dunked into the water? It says that he baptized him. Jesus went down into the water, and Jesus and, and John baptized Jesus. Um, it doesn't say Jesus was immersed. It says he was baptized. That's another one of those things that divide between Christianity and Sunday. Some Christians are completely right. And that's where a study of the actual word of of the, to baptize. What does it actually mean? And we'll look at we'll look at one of the passages where the word baptize is used in the sense of washing, uh, and to say, okay, what. What kind of washing is this, right? Um, All right, now you got me. Okay, no, no, no. yes, sir. No. <laughs> you mentioned earlier uh, John the Baptist, or John the Baptist baptism and Christ baptism, or institution of baptism. What, what's the difference? How do you define Christ institution of baptism? Okay, his institution of baptism, and we'll look specifically at the passage uh, where Jesus does that, makes that command. That command is after Jesus' uh, resurrection, before his ascension, when he meets with his disciples in, in Matthew, Matthew 28, the final words of Matthew, Matthew 28. Is it, the, is it the, where he says, you need to be 
Well, he, he says, he says, first of all, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? So Jesus has all authority, which means I have I have the right to say this, right? I have the power. Uh, I and and though and so what does he say? He says, go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, and uh, there is one command in the Great Commission. There's only one command. Uh, and again, as you look at the, the basics of that passage, the command that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 28 is to, uh, as, as it's translated in the NIV, uh, make disciples. Uh, the old King James, go ye therefore and teach all, all nations. Uh, the verb there is, the, the main verb in that sentence is actually to disciple people. It's the, it's the verb form of disciple. Uh, and, uh, and so how do you disciple? How do you make disciples? How do you teach people? Uh, well, Jesus says you make, go, you make disciples by, first of all, by going. Right? And all the other, uh, and there again, here's your, here's your English grammar stuff, right? They say, well, ah, I don't like that grammar stuff. Grammar stuff is really important when you're, when you're studying God's word and understanding what is the main, because we have to keep the main thing the main thing, right? The main thing in the Great Commission is to make disciples, to, to teach, to, to share God's word with people. And Jesus says, you go, you do that by going, right? So that's a participle that's attached to making disciples. Baptize is a participle attached to making disciples. Teach is a participle attached to the main main verb of making disciples. So, right, so if it helps, right? So the Great Commission is to, I'm just going to say, to disciple people, right? Right, and so you go, you baptize, and you teach everything. See? That's the Great Commission. Baptized is an essential part of that. So essential that when we see the, the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit says to Philip, go, right, and you go to that Ethiopian eunuch that's, that, that's over there in that chariot, what does he do? He goes over there, he finds him reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, and he asks him the, the all-important question. Remember the question that Philip asked the Ethiopian? Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, unless someone explains it to me? Well, can I explain it to you? All right, so what does he do? He hops up in the chariot, and they start, start traveling along, right? And he's teaching him everything. He tells him the good news, starting with that passage of Scripture, right? He, he tells him it's not talking about Isaiah. Is he, is he talking about himself, or is he talking about, about someone else, right? Uh, and so he teaches them everything. Now, Luke, in the words that the Holy Spirit gives him, the Holy Spirit chooses not to give us a point-by-point -point detail of the instruction course that, that Philip goes through with, with the Ethiopian. But we do know that he told them of the good news about Jesus. And we do know that the good news about Jesus included Jesus' command to baptize because as they're traveling down the road, the minute they come to the water, right, he slams on the brakes of the chariot. And he says, there's water. I want to be baptized. Right? So baptism is an essential part of this. Right? And, and what does Jesus do? He says, go. He says, baptize. He says, teach. All three of those are to be essential. Now, this is jump, maybe jumping ahead a little bit, right? but uh, depending on uh, the people that the Lord places before us and the age of the people, right? We also, right, we can't just look at this. We also look at what, is, what does God say about uh, this, this thing called faith. And he says it's a gift. Right? So who can God give that gift to? Everyone he wants. Anyone he chooses. 
right? How does God give us that gift? How does he give us that gift of faith? Does he just come up to Sheila one day and say, boom, Sheila, you are a believer. I'm giving you that gift. God could do it that way, but what does he reveal to us on how he does it? He does it through the word, right? He does it through the good news of the gospel. That's getting into our, our uh, uh, the next uh, bottom, or the middle of the page there where we're going to look at that in here in just a second. But you look at, you look at what God tells us there, right? And, okay, so God's word has to be involved. So what do we have in baptism? We have, and what is the word that God gives to us? Think back to the Great Commission again. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now it doesn't seem like much, does it? But what's so important about that formula that Jesus gives to us for baptism? Okay, the authority... What's, what's that? Soterian, all three persons. Hey, so explain the word soterian for those who may not understand it. Sorry, that, trinitarian. Oh, trinitarian. I'm sorry. Did you say spirit? Okay, you said you said trinitarian. I'm sorry. I heard soterian. Sorry about that. Uh, but soterian works too. too so uh, <laughs> that's the the cell, okay. salvation, right? That that God that God gives to us. Uh, when Jesus says. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. We have a whole commandment on the name of God, don't we? Why is, why is God so concerned about us, uh, the way that we use, and he says, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God? Margaret? Uh, the, the name of a person tells you what you need to know about them. We all know facts about Abraham Lincoln. It's a name. We all know who Abraham Lincoln is and what he did. Okay. The name of God Right? And, and why has God given me his name? Right, God has not given me his name to shout it out when I hit my thumb with a hammer. Right, That's not the reason why God has given me his name. He hasn't given me his name to use when I'm really mad at someone and I want something bad to happen to them. That's not the reason why God has given me his name. God has given me his name to bless me and to save me. Right, The name of the Lord God is and and goes it goes all the way back right to to the beginning right to, to Genesis chapter two when we see that personal name right the Lord in all capital letters used in, in chapter two by the way a little sidelight there in Genesis chapter one when we see the creating activity it's God the powerful one who's creating everything with his with his <coughs> power of his word in Genesis 2, when we see the love aspect of what he's doing in creation of, of man and woman and creating marriage and all the blessings that he's given, the Lord is used, personal name. When God makes the promise in Genesis 3 as he's talking and putting the curse on the serpent, it's the Lord. It's his personal name. And then later, th thousands of years later at the burning bush when Moses is asking all those questions, well, what, what should I say when the people... people Ask me if I go and they say, well, who sent you? What, what am I supposed to say? I am. I am who I am, which is Lord in all capital letters. I did, it's actually a, a form of the, the Hebrew verb to be. I am who I am. Right? He is the I am God. Not I was God. I will be God. I used to be God. But I am God. The I am. Uh, the God of consistency. The God of, of free and faithful love. The God who always keeps his promises. He's, he's the creator, right? Uh, but, but again, when we look at now the name, <coughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who has taken care of everything, right? This Trinitarian God, right? Even though the word Trinity isn't used in Scripture, but it's the, the teaching, right? The, the truth of who God is that we use that word Trinity to describe, right? Not to define, right? Put it, but to describe because I can't define it. I can't understand it. But I can describe it as, as, the, as the scriptures do, which is all we can do. Father who created us and takes care of us. Son who redeemed us. Right? 
Holy Spirit who, who brings us to faith, right, and, and has that, that power in our hearts. That is the name, right, and it's, and the, uh, I really want to get into some interesting grammar. Then we, we go to, uh, you know, when he says in the name, literally it's into the name or in reference to, with reference to the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so as we baptize in, right, or with reference to, this is the name that is being placed upon this person being baptized. And then we look at all those other beautiful passages about what God says about us having his name. Born again of water and the spirit, flesh gives birth to flesh, the spirit gives birth to spirit. Right? Uh, the Holy Spirit, right, and, and in uh, the middle of, of Romans chapter 8, we see this, this beautiful uh, passage where the, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. We're going to share in his suffering, but we're also going to share in his glory, and we can cry out, Abba, Father. This is a real relationship, but it's a relationship that God creates with us. It's not a relationship that, that we look to bring in with God or to, to strengthen with God. Say, I, God, I, I want to be close to you. That, that does take place in our lives, right, as we express our love for God. But as John tells us very clearly in his first letter, why do we love? Because he first loved us. Right? There's no love in this heart of mine until God creates it. And shows me his love. And that's what God does in baptism. But there also has to be teaching, right? Teaching everything. So, if it's a little baby, we baptize, and then we teach. Right? We make sure, right? And if you, if you think of, of our, our order of baptism, right? The exhortation that takes place after baptism. There is, a, there is a section after, right, where parents, uh, sponsors, and congregation say, we're going to do everything that we possibly can so this new child of God may remain in their faith throughout their lives, right, which is going to come by teaching, right? So, so we, we, we try to provide resources for our parents to, to train those, those little ones. Right? Uh, we offer Sunday school and you know all these, these different opportunities to gather into, into, into God's, God's work. Easter for kids and all these, all these other events and activities to, to get, get the little ones um, in. And I'll, I'll give an example uh, as we get into the notes uh, of, of one that I've used that, I've, that I've, for me I found to be, be very helpful in, in seeing that, that process. But if it's an older person who hasn't been baptized, who doesn't know Jesus, I'm going to teach them And then baptize, and then teach some more. But in both cases, right, you have baptizing and you have teaching. One is baptize and then teach, and continue teaching, right, throughout their lives. The other is you teach, you baptize, and then you teach some more. But teaching and baptizing go in, in both cases. That was a really long answer to a very short question, but uh, but I think I think a, a necessary look at at what uh, what is what is Jesus actually telling us to do? Right, He's telling us the Great Commission is to disciple people, uh, and we disciple people, and and the the institution of baptism is there as part of the Great Commission. All right, so we look at the at what Scripture tells us uh, the middle of the page then. Uh, this this means of grace, right? Teaching them everything, right? And, and again, the, the word there, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Uh, but understand the word obey there, uh, right? When he says teaching them to obey everything. Um, God isn't saying, okay, you make sure that they understand that and follow everything that I'm telling you. Um, that is there, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a 
after the process. Um, the word, the, the literal word that Jesus uses there is uh, the same word that he uses uh, throughout the New Testament to describe this obedience that we have. Um, Jesus uses it over and over again in the upper room in, in uh, John 13 to, uh, to, to 16. All right, when he says, if you love me, you will obey, right? You will keep what I command. Um, the, the Greek word there is the word terepo. Uh, now, the word may not mean much, but understand that a lot of our English words come from Greek words. What, what, is, what English word? What? Not terrible. Treasure. 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 We get the English word treasure from it. Um, and Phil, Phil gave another good translation, to keep. right? Um, and if you think of it, keep in the sense of a keeper. A goalkeeper. Right? Um, and right, if you've, if you've uh, ever played soccer or, or hockey or you watch, right, what is the purpose of the goalkeeper? To protect the goal, right? Protect it from anything happening, right? That means no, no ball or puck gets by him. Um, he's going to guard it, right? Because he knows how important that that is, and he's not going to let anything happen to it, right? So I treasure, right? I guard it. I keep it. Uh, and yes, as I'm guarding and keeping God's word so that nothing happens to it, nobody changes it, right? No, it... I'm also looking to follow what it says. So obey is, is a good translation. As long as I understand what's, that God isn't say, saying, I'm giving you a bunch of rules to follow, now you make sure and follow them. Right? We have to avoid that because that takes us down a path uh, that takes us away from focusing on Jesus. Here's what Jesus gives me to do. Now I just have to do these things. I don't know about you, but every time I try to simply do what God tells me to do, the same thing happens that happened to me uh, when we were um, on a short short vacation um, beginning of, of last year in in uh, Myrtle Beach. Uh, we had checked in; it was it was late at night. Uh, the parking lot was across the street and in a parking garage. Um, Shields took our stuff up. I went over to the parking garage, parked, was walking back. It was dark. First time being there, didn't really know where I was going. Um, and I didn't see that in the parking spots, they had the concrete barriers. Um, and I was just walking back. I, it's the only time in my life where I was walking, and then I wasn't. <laughs> uh, and, but it's right. It, but every time we simply try to do what God tells us to do, it's a it's a face plant. Now, fortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, I'm not sure. Uh, it, I didn't fall, you know, directly on my face. But you know, you you look at that and say, okay, if I'm simply going to try to do everything that God tells me to do, right? If I need to obey God, I get frustrated because I. Because I keep going back to Romans 7. What I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I don't want to do. That's what I keep on doing, right? I try to obey God, and I fall flat on my face. God wants us to treasure what he says. It's, it's a heart thing. Um, yes, it is also an action thing, right? We don't want to simply take away the action and say, as long as your heart's in it, you can do whatever you, you, know, you, do whatever you want. God doesn't say that. But he does say, I want your heart. And when I have your heart, then the actions will follow. And let's face it, that's true in every relationship that we have, isn't it? Right? Parents, if you tell your kids to do something, you're not just looking for them to do what you asked them to do, are you? Um, if, if all you hear is grumbling and complaining as they're doing what you asked them to do, are you satisfied when they've done it? Clean your room. I don't want to clean my room. Clean your room. I don't want to clean my room. Clean your room or you're grounded for a week. All right, I'll clean my room. 
you hear this stuff banging around and you know in the in the room is there slamming drawers and putting everything away. All right, I clean my room. God, I'm very happy we did. Right? I don't think that ever happens, does it? Right? If that's the attitude that was going on while they're cleaning the room, you're not just looking for obedience. You'd rather have a, a loving action where everything is not spick and span than a spick and span room with a grumpy kid who still has an attitude. Am I right? God wants, God wants our hearts. Right? He wants our hearts. And, and that's the, the treasuring that, that, he, uh, that he gives to us. All right, so what are the blessings that God wants for us? Okay, God's reservoir, this is, this is where he has all of his blessings for us. And that reservoir is the gospel, right? The good news of Jesus. Right? So, uh, and I know the, the, the diagram on the page doesn't quite match up with everything. Um, but uh, if you want to put gospel in that little um, half, half circle oval thing, uh, go ahead. But what are, the, what are the blessings that God gives us in the gospel? He gives us forgiveness. He gives us a new life, right? Because the old life wasn't good enough, and the old sinful nature can't be trained to be good. So God gives us a new life, right? We call it our new life in Christ. And with forgiveness and that new life comes salvation. That's what God gives us in the gospel. And the, God's goal is to have that in our hearts, so what are the means, right? What's the pipeline that God uses for his blessings that are found in his gospel to get those blessings into our hearts? Right? And that, right? He wants it into our hearts. And he does that through the word, right? He does that through the scriptures. And he also does it through his word in the sacraments, right? So both of those are, are the gospel, right? Baptism and, and, and Lord's Supper. So these are the blessings that God has. He wants them in our hearts. And this is the way that he, that he uh, gives them to us. good news of what Jesus has accomplished with the forgiveness and the new life and the salvation, it's found on the pages of the scriptures. It's also found in God's word as he gives it through the sacraments. So that those real blessings of forgiveness, a, a real new life, and, and real salvation are found in both the word and the sacraments. I've used this diagram for for decades uh, because it is probably one of the clearest clearest ways, right? And that helps us to understand when we talk about the means of grace, right? The means by which God's grace gets to us, or the, the pipeline, right? Uh, that's the means by which your water gets into your house, right? You've got pipes running into your into your house. Uh, the water you know, the water just doesn't magically appear out of the faucet, right? Uh, there's pipes that bring the water in, and then there's pipes that take the water and other stuff out. Right? There's, and, and when either of those pipes don't work, right, there's, there's trouble. Right? You either have uh, no water or you have stuff that's backing up into your house. Neither one of those is good. Uh, so there, there, there's a pipeline. Okay? Questions on that? I don't want to just race through this. I want to make sure that we're... Um, that we're, uh, we're understanding this pipeline and, and the, the real blessings that God has for us. All right, so what is a sacrament? Okay, does everybody have down what they, what they I don't want to jump on to the next slide until... Okay, so a sacrament is a sacred act. Uh, what do we mean by a sacred act? 
If something is sacred, it is holy. holy. Exactly. So it is a holy thing that 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 God has has given us, and it's specifically instituted by Jesus. In other words, it's something that Jesus Himself has instructed and commanded us to do. It's not something that Jesus just talked about and said, "Yeah, if you want to do this, go ahead." No, it's something that Jesus says. Do this, right? Make disciples by going, by baptizing, right? Make disciples by baptizing. That's a command from Jesus. Okay, it always has God's word because it is the gospel. But in this sense, it is the gospel that also uses a visible element. Um, I like to describe it as the gospel with a visual aid. Right? So it's something, something, uh, and, and so what does God do, right? God not only shares the message, but he also appeals to my senses, right? Uh, and because, I mean, think about the importance that our senses have. Uh, you might think that pain is an, is an unnecessary or a, a bad thing. Uh, pain is actually a good thing. Can you think of how pain is a good thing? Yeah, it tells you something that's not right. Okay, it tells you something isn't right. Um, are you familiar with the modern uh, modern disease of leprosy? And I can't remember the, the specific... It, what's that? Hansen's disease. Yes, Hansen's disease. Um, and it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a grotesque disease because people end up losing fingers and, and, and things. Do you know why that is? Margaret, our biology major here. Um, it's a part of nerve damage, so you can't feel in the nerves and your fingers or extremities to begin with. It's um, it's I mean, I've read some read some stories. There, there's a um, in in India for some reason they still have uh, quite a number of cases. Also Louisiana, there's a uh, I think an actual leper colony that that was in Louisiana. I'm not sure if it still is. Uh, but uh, the writer of, of this report was talking about his, his interaction with the leprosy patients. And uh, at the, the place where, where all the lepers were, were staying, because right, they thought it was a, uh, a, you know, a, a contagious. contagious, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a contagious disease. Uh, but so leprosy is often used in the Bible as a, kind of a, uh, an umbrella term for skin diseases, many of which are, are contagious. But he was talking about, uh, the, and again, since it was this type of a facility, uh, maintenance wasn't always really good. And so uh, there was a door that was, was sticking uh, or something, and the, and the, 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 uh, the owner or the, the, the doctor wasn't able to open the door. And, and one of, the, one of the, the patients said, well, let me try. And, and you know, he's turning and turning, and then he just he pushes on it um, and you know, gets the door open. Um, and then... Uh, you know, and he just he's going to continue on, and, and all of a sudden the doctor looks down, and his hand is completely bloody. His uh, the doorknob came off and literally went through his hand, uh, and he's just walking on like it's like it's like there's nothing. Uh, and so what happens, right? They have these injuries, infection sets sets in, gangrene, and they end up losing losing their limbs. Uh, we might think pain is a bad thing, but if I touch a hot stove, I want my my nerves to be very pain sensitive, right? Because what happens if I don't have any pain and I touch, touch the hot stove, right? I just leave my hand there and my hand just starts burning, right? Um, and if I don't feel that, right? Senses are, are, are a very good thing. And one of the most powerful senses that we have, right, is the, the sense of touch and the sense of, of smell. Um, I, I still smell certain things and it takes me back to a specific memory from from childhood right or you know uh the, the smell of a certain smell of fresh bread baking right it takes me walking into my grandma's grandma's house on saturday on saturdays when i was a kid uh you know or or certain certain flowers right it might take you to a certain certain thing right it's and so what is what does god do god uses things that we can see taste touch smell feel along with the power of his of his word. So water, bread, wine, right? Uh, 
but it's, but it's not just water, and it's not just bread and wine. It's God's powerful word in action. Um, and uh, I, would, I would suggest uh, going back to Luther's catechism to review um, the, the four parts of the sacraments. Right? It's not just plain water, but it's water used with God's command, connected with God's word. How can water do these things? It's not the water that does them, right? But it's the word of God in and with the water and faith which trusts this word of God. And without the word of God, it's just plain water. And it's not baptism. With the word of God, right, it's this powerful washing away of, of sins and, and new life and, and salvation. Um, and the same thing uh, when we get to when we get the Lord's Supper, too. Um, and by the way, um, in our new hymnal, uh, the entire catechism is in the front part of the, of the hymnal as well. So... Um, that's a, another another opportunity to take a look at, at, at that as well. All right, so it uses visible elements that are connected with God's word. <clears throat> and since it is connected with God's word, it actually offers and gives these blessings, forgiveness, new life, and salvation. Right? It's not pictured in these sacraments. It's not a symbol of what God has done for us. It is the actual occurrence of forgiveness. It is the actual creation of new life. It is the actual gift of God's salvation. Why? Because it is, it is God's word, exactly. It's God's word. It doesn't do it because there's some kind of special water that we use. It doesn't do it because uh, of a certain way in which, I, in which I do it. It doesn't do it because of the power of the person that's, that's, that's uh, you know, administering the, the baptism or, or Lord's Supper. Uh, it does it because of the power of the word and the name of the God who saves. Uh, and again, that keeps it very simple, doesn't it? Uh, but, but please don't misunderstand simplicity for power. And I think oftentimes we do, right? This is so simple. How could, how could this, you know, because, you know, in our order of baptism, we have, uh, we have uh, a number of things that we do, right? We go back and we, we uh, recount what's, what uh, the, the sinful nature. We do all of those things. But the actual baptism in our, our order of baptism takes all of about 10 seconds. Right? You call the person by name, and you apply that water in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's baptism. No, 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 that's, that's too simple. There's got to be something more to it. Yes, it does. My power, my power isn't complicated. My power is simple and straightforward. And it's found in the name of uh, that I have, have given you the name. Uh, and, and think of how the, how the apostles responded to the religious leaders in Acts when they were told to stop teaching about Jesus. We can't help speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard because there is no other name under heaven given to, to people, given to men by which we must be saved. It is that name. Uh, right? And so uh, one way to, to help um, to, is to remember the word office. And again, uh, in this sense, it's, a, it's an acronym. Um, so it offers and gives forgiveness, new life and salvation. It's instituted by Christ. It's connected to God's word. And there's external signs or elements or signs. So if that helps you to, to, to remember that as well, uh, that's, that may, may be a helpful, helpful hint for you as, also. <clears throat> All right, we are almost out of time, and I just assume not go into a brand new section with only a couple minutes left. Um, any questions on this first page or anything that we've talked about this morning? Phil. I just wanted to make a comment, right? This is one definition of sacrament, right? Sacrament is a human term we came up with. It's yes. The definition, the sacrament isn't defined in the Bible, right? So it's not it, we obviously come up with right. categories to help us. Right. But, you know, our confessions do say that you can consider 
for confession and absolution to be a sacrament, there isn't necessarily a visible sign. Right. And then also that ordination could be considered a sacrament. Again, there isn't necessarily a visible sign. Right. Depending on how you do it. But um, just something to remember. Again, for the purposes of this Bible study, great piece. But, you know, there are other things that offer the forgiveness of sin. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and uh, and Luther, Luther addresses that in the catechism as well. Right? So, uh, so we have... Uh, right. What is what is confession? And he, he, right. And he says confession embraces two parts. Right. One is that we acknowledge our sins before God. The other is that we cling to Jesus' forgiveness. Right. Uh, and so uh, we we have. Uh, and I guess you know. And, and I know what, what you mean by by ordination, but I didn't receive forgiveness of sins when I when I was ordained. Uh, you no, know, it's because you're distributing it. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but each one of us has that authority <coughs> to offer forgiveness, right? When we look at the at the uh, the thing, the thing that that allows me um, and and gives me the authority uh, to stand before you on Sunday morning and. Uh, you know, in our confession, as we have our corporate confession, and then I announce the forgiveness of sins, uh, is is because of the the call into public ministry that I have received. Right, the Holy Spirit has called me uh, to offer that in the name of and on behalf of of the congregation as, as a called servant of the Word. Right, that is that is what allows me to to be able to uh, to be able to do that for you. And that's the, the only difference, right, between you offering somebody forgiveness and me offering forgiveness is that I'm doing it as a called servant of the word. Uh, I'm doing it on behalf of and in the name of, right, Lamb of God Lutheran Church. Um, and the same holds true for, for normal cases in baptism. Right? You're not just gonna, you know, anybody, anybody, come on up and and uh, say, well, I just had a baby. I want to, I want to go baptize my baby. So you just walk on up to the font and 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 uh, and do that. Uh, no, you've called me to administer those those things in, because God also tells us to do everything in a fitting in a in a fitting order, right? Um, and uh, God is a God of, of order, and so yeah, we do have an order for that. Uh, but I think I've I may have shared this. Um, I know I shared it with our um, our Bible Basics class. I don't know if I've shared it in, in this class, but um, I remember specifically one um, one family, uh, the previous congregation that I served. Uh, they were expecting a baby, and they knew there were complications. Um, have I shared that with you? Um, they they knew there were complications, and they weren't sure that their their little girl was going to survive. Um, and uh, she was coming, coming uh, close to her, her due dates, and I sat down with the couple, and I said, uh, you know, you, you let me know when you go to the hospital, and, you know, I will do my best to, to be there. I said, however, I said, if, if I am unable to, to be there, um, and then I looked at Dad, and I said, you know, here's, here's what you do. Um, and interesting enough, he is, he's, he's an adult, uh, adult confirmand, uh, and the church that he grew up in uh, was uh, a church that didn't baptize babies. Uh, but little Sophia was born on Palm Sunday morning uh, during the worship service. Uh, I couldn't cut out of the worship service to, to go to the hospital to baptize. So, uh, so he, he baptized her. Uh, and within 24 hours, she was in heaven. Now, as sad as it was for that couple, right, to lose that newborn little baby girl. On Good Friday, when we had the sermon, or had the service, uh, I was able to specifically tell that family God's grace was administered to her. And I could look at Dad and say, God used you as his administer of, uh, as his minister of, of, of his grace uh, that I can... That, and you can be 100% absolutely confident that she is rejoicing with Jesus in heaven right now. Uh, now, again, extreme sadness, but also extreme comfort. Uh, and uh, but but to, to to be able to to, to have that, and and so um, 
in each edition of our of our, our hymnals, we've we've had the, the emergency form for, for baptism, right? It's very simple, right? Uh, you make sure you have water, right? And, I've, uh, and again, God doesn't tell me how much water. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, as we get into the study here in the next next couple of weeks here. Uh, but uh, I I remember a baptism for uh, a 24 week preemie little girl uh, who I don't think she was over a pound when she was was born. Uh, she fit in my hand. Um, and I used an eyedropper, maybe a couple of couple of drops of, of water is all that I, I was able to use in that baptism. Uh, was she any less baptized than, than anybody else? No. Right? Uh, because again, the power is in the word. The power is in the word. Alright. Um, let's close then today with, with prayer, and then uh, next time we'll we'll start at the top of page 15. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this, this grace that you've given to us. Uh, be with us, Lord. Uh, guide us and fill us with the comfort that you, that you give to us. Uh, remind us of the power of your word that brought us to faith, uh, the power of your word and sacrament that, that brought us to faith and keeps us strong in our faith by, by taking us back to your name, uh, the only name that saves, the only name that forgives, the only name that brings us peace every day of our lives, and the only name that uh, that can be with us for all eternity. Uh, guide us, Lord, as we uh, now uh, begin this, this walk during this holy week uh, down the path that, that you took to the cross. Uh, guide us and fill us with that, that comfort that can only come from seeing the magnitude of your love for us. We ask it all in your name, dear Savior. Amen.